This is the Nikon D500. Bonjour, bienvenue à l'espace YouTube à Paris. The D500 is a flagship camera. It has everything you want in a camera, with one small exception. The sensor is DX, or APS-C sized. In every other way, this is the DSLR to beat. It has a few quirks, but let's start with power. Because this is a powerhouse of a camera. You only have to open the card slot door to find that it supports SD as well as XQD to realize that this camera has upped its game. There's the ISO speed, which extends into six figures, the burst mode, which clocks over 10 frames per second, and 153 focus points. Don't overlook video, it's got 4K with all the bells and whistles, UHD 4K at 24, 25, and 30 frames. It's also a purist's camera, Although it's fully automated, it's free of gimmicks like scene modes or features like panorama. That said, it does have power features like bracket and time lapse. It's impressively responsive. Even in auto, you can essentially capture exactly the scene you see. In other words, fast. It's a good size, and at 760 grams for the body, along with 480 grams for the kit lens, it adds up to a kilo and a quarter but it is well proportioned and very comfortable in my hand. All the buttons are logically and ergonomically located, with the right hand on the grip, left hand alternating between the lens and the controls on the left of the lens and the back panel. With time, I might even master their locations with my eye on the viewfinder. There's a large and comfortable eye cup on the viewfinder with the diopter adjustment dial that pulls out turns far enough for my prescription, and then snaps in to stay locked in place. Flash shoe, but no onboard flash. First, let's max up the settings. With both an XQD card and an SD card, the XQD is my primary, saving RAW while the SD saves JPEGs. DX image area, 24 by 16, the full dimensions of the sensor, quality NEF or RAW with JPEG fine. Size, JPEG large 20 megapixel RAW, large 20 megapixel RAW lossless compressed, bit depth 14. To configure the camera for point and shoot, press the mode button and turn the back dial to select program mode using the info panel on top. The D500 has auto ISO, which is a bit tricky. With auto ISO on, I've set the maximum sensitivity to 51.2 and the minimum shutter to 1 60th. Now, if the shutter would be slower than 1 60th, the D500 will automatically increase the ISO until it gets to 51.2. Then it will slow the shutter to get the shot. Press the WB button and turn the rear dial to set white balance to auto. Press the key button to set the picture control to standard, watching the LCD. Right side of the left top button to set the meter mode, displayed in the top left of the panel, or lower left of the viewfinder, to matrix. On the kit lens, autofocus switch on, VR stabilization on, focus switch beside the lens to autofocus, then press the center of the switch and turn the rear dial to select autofocus single, Keep pressing and turn the front dial to select auto. With a little dexterity, you can do the same thing with your eye in the viewfinder. Now we're using the camera's power to take pictures simply. Although many photographers feel that this doesn't take full advantage of the camera, I disagree. This really uses all of the camera's power and potential. That said, the D500 can be set to full manual mode to let experienced photographers exercise the full power of their creativity. As with other Nikons, lots of useful and well-positioned buttons and controls. Front dial for aperture, rear for shutter. They can be reversed in custom settings, the other thing this camera has plenty of. Although this option isn't particularly clear or well documented, turning exposure setting on does it. Press the meter button and turn the dial to select matrix, center weighted, spot or highlight weighted, a Nikon specific feature which exposes the overall scene to the brightest point. I find that very useful. Press the ISO button to set and turn the rear dial. 100 to 51.2 are presented in a straightforward fashion and then it gets a bit tricky. First, turn off the auto ISO sensitivity control. There are three settings under 100, L.3, 0.7, and 1. 
EXIF data for pictures taken at those settings report ISOs of 80, 64, and 50. There's an increase in contrast with those settings. At the other end, there are 7H settings from 0.3 to 5. EXIF records ISO from 64,000 up to 1.6 million. Up to 100,000, maybe, but at 400,000 and above, the images are just overwhelmed by purple noise. And that's with high ISO reduction at normal. Here's 100K normal and high noise reduction. But don't let the extremes distract you from the impressive results between 6400 and 51.2. Using auto ISO sensitivity, I got a lot of shots at high ISOs in churches and dark interiors like the new Cité du Vin in Bordeaux. In shutter and aperture priority, press the EV button and turn the rear dial to set the exposure value. In manual exposure mode, the EV display transforms into an exposure meter. Meter also appears in the viewfinder. Review your images on the LCD using the play button. Touch to swipe, pinch, and zoom. Press up or down on the controller for image data, including the actual file name. Use the photo shooting menu to select one of three auto bracket options for combinations of exposure and flash. Hold the bracket button and turn the rear dial to select 3 to 9 exposures. Use the front dial to set the increment from third of a stop to three stops. The graphical meter display shows the selection. In single, press the shutter once for each exposure. Each is removed from the meter display once taken. Set the drive dial, a caller under the mode controller, to self timer for continuous auto bracket. Return to zero to cancel bracket mode. Press the white balance button and turn the rear dial to select a white balance preset or using the front dial to set the degrees Kelvin. There are six custom settings. To create a custom setting, press the WB button until the pre icon in the bottom right starts to flash. Expose a white card or other reference. The camera confirms with good. Further white balance adjustments can be made from the menu for each preset. With a six step latitude at half step increments in amber blue and quarter step for green magenta. There is an interesting and complicated white balance bracket feature that's available if you're not shooting raw. Use the photo setting menu to set auto bracketing to white balance bracketing. As before, rear dial sets the number of images, front dial the increment in myriads. These three images are incremented by three myriads. Turning the rear dial in the other direction, you'll find B settings that add blue and A settings that add amber. I'm going to stick with raw. After setting the white balance, move on to picture controls. Press the key button for the six presets. Neutral and flat provide less processing. Flat provides a wider dynamic range. I'll recommend that for video, particularly if you intend to do color grading in post. Further custom modifications are available to fine tune, and it's worth mentioning that Mono has several color filter effects. The review kit came with the DX16-80 kit lens, which exceeds all my kit lens expectations. In size, it has a 72mm filter diameter and performance. Focus by wire, but define travel with a focus distance guide window. Stabilization on, off, as well as normal and active. Nikon recommends active for situations when you're walking or in a moving vehicle. Stabilization starts once you soft press the shutter. Aperture ramps from f2.8 to 4, minimum focus distance 35 centimeters. For manual focus, set both the lens switch and the body switch to M, AF, and MA for auto. In the viewfinder bottom left, the circle confirms focus or arrows indicate which way to turn. Press the body focus button and turn the rear dial to select single or continuous focus. Use the front dial to select auto, single, or group. The D500 features up to 153 focus points depending on the lens. 55 points can be selected for single. Use either the focus point dial or the subselector joystick to select five rows, 11 columns. Double press the button to recenter. Lock the point by rotating the dial to L. Lots of focus settings in the custom A group, including reducing the single point selection from 55 to 15, and setting independent horizontal and vertical orientation points. 
Focus tracking can be adjusted with setting A3 to adjust focus reaction time when a new object enters the frame, and between erratic or back and forth motion to steady or predictable movement. I was also intrigued by the AF fine tune feature to set a super accurate focus for a specific lens. However, the manual doesn't explain how to use it, offering only a warning that it's not recommended for most situations. And maybe it's the kit lens, but although focus is accurate and confident, it's not the fastest. However, the overall responsiveness gets the shot with very few exceptions. Typically, the camera won't release in single auto unless it is in focus. Override that with custom setting A2, or use A8 to remove the focus release interlock, then press the AF on button to focus. There is no electronic or quiet shutter option in spite of the promise of the Q setting on the drive mode dial, which merely suppresses the mirror reset. Many DSLRs include a quickly lost viewfinder cap to suppress light leak when using self-timer modes. The D500 has a lever to close the viewfinder. Much better. I've been showing the top info panel, but press the info button to see a more graphical display on the LCD screen. This screen, while useful, is not touch enabled. All of that applies to shooting with the viewfinder. Or shoot with the LCD, which can be quite useful for high and low angles, or if you just can't get your eye behind the camera. Press the LV button to turn on LCD or live view mode, which could also be called mirrorless mode as it moves the mirror out of the way. Slide the lever beside the viewfinder closed when using Live View to prevent light leaks. Live View focus modes include face detection and subject tracking. The big advantage here is touch to focus and shoot, a feature that I find quite useful and valuable. Use the on-screen button to activate, then touch and snap. Shooting in Live View is a little slower with a double click. If you decide to use manual focus in Live View, Press the Magnify button for an expanded focus view. Press I in Live View to use an on-screen menu, which offers options including split-screen display zoom. This can provide super accurate leveling. By default, Live View, which is quite battery hungry, turns off after 10 minutes. Custom setting C4 has some preset options to change that. Press the Info button for a histogram and dual axis virtual horizon. Video is only available in Live View. Slide the Live View switch to the movie camera position. At the YouTube space in Paris, we're shooting 4K video in the TV friendly 16x9 UHD format. Live HDMI out, with or without overlay. Overlay only in HD, so we're switching to that for a moment. Choose 24, 25, or 30 frames in 4K, 50, and 60 in HD. Then, Using the Settings menu, select HDMI, Advanced, and set Live View on Screen Display to On, or Off if you're recording a clean feed on an external recorder. That displays audio meters. Press Info for a histogram and a level. We're shooting in manual with a shutter at 1 60th. Turn the front dial to adjust the aperture, then press ISO and turn the rear dial to set the ISO. Press I for the movie settings, which include microphone sensitivity and zebra or highlight display on or off and headphone levels. Touch focus, which makes a rack focus really easy to do. With most cameras, I'm now used to seeing focus hit a spot quickly but there's still some hunting here, and the exposure adjustment that's evident when not recording doesn't appear when you are, although that may be a peculiarity of this lens. Focus with this lens is also kind of noisy and it's picked up by the internal mic. For quiet work, you'll want to record externally. The multi-selector power aperture puts aperture control on the multi-controller to change aperture on the fly without the click detents of the front ring. Movie ISO is independent of stills with its own auto settings. In addition to the mini-sized HDMI port, there are mic in and headphone jacks and a USB 3 port. Nikon provides a clip to secure the cable, a valuable accessory.
maximum record length is 30 minutes minus a second, and even after two back-to-back 30-minute -back recordings, the left side feels only warm, so the danger of overheating seems small. Files are recorded in the H.264 format with an MOV wrapper. Files are saved in 4 GB chunks, approximately 4 minutes 30 each. As the file length reaches its maximum, the file name flashes yellow, then red, then the next file number appears. Video can be recorded on either the XQD or SD card. Incidentally, XQD doesn't improve movie performance. Both SD and XQD record the maximum 4K 30 frames at 120 megabits per second. If the camera is turned on with the LV switch in movie, pressing the shutter starts live view, pressing again starts recording. Handy or annoying, take your pick. Going back to stills means flipping the switch. In-body electronic VR for movie mode is not available in 4K, neither is active D lighting. The D500's major video shortcoming is the LCD, as the viewfinder is not available when shooting video. This reduces stability and makes it hard to see when you're shooting on sunny days. That makes an LCD viewfinder adapter or external EVF a necessity. The custom menu's self-timer setting sets the delay from 2 to 20 seconds, from 1 to 9 shots, and the between shot time from 1 half to 3 seconds. That should enable you to get a group shot with everyone looking their best. For burst, the continuous low mode can be set from 1 to 9 frames per second. Continuous high does 10 per. It maxes out at 200 frames. A custom setting can reduce but not increase this amount. Unless you're shooting in shutter or manual modes with a shutter speed of 4 seconds or longer. Very useful for night photography, particularly for star trails. I wanted to see the impact of using a speedy Sony G-Series XQD card, but found the results to be slightly inconsistent. Using full manual exposure, I recorded uncompressed 14-bit RAW, which generates 44 megabyte files, getting from 54 to 69 frames at about 10 per second before buffering out. Compressed RAW plus JPEG, each pair totaling about 38 megs, slows to about 7 per second. With JPEG fine only, the maximum 200 images in 23 seconds. That just beats anything I've seen. By the way, while you're shooting, the top display shows you the status of the buffer in the lower right. Interesting if not totally useful. With only an SD card, JPEG buffers out at about 160, RAW Plus at 23, uncompressed RAW 34. Still very impressive. Also impressive? The autofocus system can keep up with this rate, and the viewfinder mirror blackout is extremely short. Although mirrorless cameras should have an advantage here, the D500 outruns them. Multiple exposure is much more than the ability to expose the same frame with two different images. Use the menu to set up to 10 exposures with four combination modes. Used with variable burst, the effect is quite interesting, although as these images taken with the darkened setting illustrate, finding the right scene can be tricky. Finding the right combination of burst rate and shutter speed also requires some trial and error, but it demonstrates the versatility and flexibility the D500 offers. The intervalometer range is one half second to 24 hours, can take up to nine shots per up to 10,000 minus one intervals for stills. There's a time lapse function in the movie menu which saves video files, but not when an external monitor is connected. The custom settings menu offers lots of customizations, many of which are quite useful. For example, F6. If you find it difficult or inconvenient to hold a button and turn the dial simultaneously, this setting lets you press and release the button and then turn. Sadly, most are not well documented. Even more confusing are the four photo shooting menu banks and the extended photo menu banks. I'd say they help you jump to specific shooting configurations, but it's not clear to me which settings are controlled, and if you change them while you're using a bank, the change is permanently applied to the bank. I do find the OK button odd. The screen asks for it, and I've pressed the center of the multi-selector, which often selects and confirms, and nothing happens. Only then do I remember that there's a dedicated OK button under my left hand. 
Battery life, as with most DSLRs, is excellent, particularly compared to mirrorless, but that advantage is reduced if you're using live view and shooting video. Even so, when the battery warning comes on, there's at least 12 minutes of video recording time left. Good to know when it's late at night and you're in chart with only one battery. Although the playback menu is basic, the retouch menu offers processing and filter options that are powerful and extensive. Stills can be saved from 4K movies, pause playback, and press the I button. In addition to a large stable of lens options, Nikon has accessories for every need, from flashes and power grips to wireless transmitters, GPS and remote controllers, as well as several desktop apps for tethered shooting, raw processing, and file management. One thing missing from Nikon's tool shed is a lens hood. In sunny situations, even with the brightness turned up full, I found the LCD hard to see. I wanted to try the mobile SnapBridge app, but it's not yet available for iOS and not compatible with my Asus Zenfone. Pity. In the meantime, the D500 doesn't work with the older WMU app. Granted, it's an old-school DSLR with the size and weight that's part of that package. I didn't enjoy carrying it around my neck, but with a strap wrapped around my wrist I had no complaints. The D500 has the intelligence for novices and a sophisticated control set for experienced shooters. Combined with Nikon's legendary image quality, the D500 is a flagship that you'd be proud to captain on your next voyage.